Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. And hello, everyone on the call. Really uh, appreciate you all taking your time to listen to the various speakers here. Hopefully, I'll have some good things that will be helpful to you as you uh, continue through your academic career and then look for uh, employment thereafter. So this this uh, title of this is basically hiring and separating yourself from your peers. And as a manager in weather services, this is probably the most single most important thing that we do. And you'll see uh, you'll see why. I mean, basically, you, you've got to have the right people for the office. Um, as Ryan said, my name is Ted Funk. I'm the Sioux here at National Weather Service in Louisville. LMK is our three-letter ID, our uh, three-letter identification. And I've been involved with hiring and with John Gordon for, for many years. So uh, we both uh, pretty much uh, come from the same spot in terms of our beliefs and uh, the things that we look for and what we'd like to hire here. So what today is, it's, it's things to consider, okay? It's information about the hiring process and what we do here at Louisville, which could be very similar to what others do at other NWS offices, and, but there's probably differences as well. So I'm gonna concentrate on how we approach things. What today is not is uh, detailed steps of how to do your paperwork. You can go to NOAA's, uh, you know, the Workforce Management Office to try to find more information on that. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly what you should or, or have to do. I mean, that's up to you. We're giving you the tools here from which you make the decisions of how you want yourself to move forward in your academic and eventually your professional career. So, okay. So this screen here, we'll start off. I mean, here's your choice. Who do you wanna be? You wanna be the person here on the upper left who's a professional, knows what he or she does very well. They're great at what they do, at their craft. They provide excellent customer service. All right, or do you want to be the you want to be one of the three stooges here? That they're the bumbling three stooges. They don't know what they're doing. They don't really care about other people. They just hit each other and, and goof around and, and don't really take their uh, themselves or their jobs seriously. It's it's basically your choice. Well, what we do is we treat selections like if you're choosing a Supreme Court justice. I mean, in the Weather Service office, we have. It varies slightly, but you know, 20, low 20s number of people. So it's a small group, just like the Supreme Court just is a small group. So if you hire one person who's not who you want, that can affect the entire, the entire office. So we really treat selections as the most important thing that we do, like choosing somebody for the Supreme Court. All right, so what do we look for in hiring here at, uh, at Louisville? Um, First and foremost, we hire for your people skills, your personality, okay? We can't train for that. We can train for science and tech skills, but we can't train for your people skills. So that's the first thing we're gonna look at. And if we, we find out that those are good, and I'll talk more about these in a little bit, then we proceed. If not, that sets up, sends a big red flag and perhaps you do not proceed uh, from there. So the other things here are not just things we would hire for at Louisville, but all, all throughout the National Weather Service, and, and for that matter, throughout many organizations, uh, in the private sector as well. So leadership potential, all right? Great customer service. Do you serve the people, your peers, your, uh, you know, the, the people you go to school with, you serve them well, all right? And in the agency, in the organization, do you serve those who we serve well, all right? Innovation, we want people who are innovative, creative, passionate, okay? John likes to use the term hungry. We want people who are hungry in what they do, not someone who just goes and does the bare minimum, but someone who goes well above and is really passionate and, and understands what you need to do to really get ahead and to really, again, provide that great customer service to those we serve. So strong work ethics, technical skills. We'll do a strength and weakness analysis. And ultimately, we want to look for the right fit. Who is the right fit for the office? We'll get a lot of people who apply and maybe the top 10 might all be great people, okay? But we need to figure out who do we want to take out of that top 10. It ultimately comes down to what do we need and who do we feel would be the best fit for us at this time. There's more information here on the, <clears throat> the Workforce Management's website at that URL. That's a hiring guide that can provide some more background information. So continuing on this theme here, skills needed in the job market. I mean, there's nothing here that's you know, something that you probably don't even, you don't already realize. We'll just go through this a little bit. Again, interpersonal skills, we'll talk about that here quickly. Leadership, time management. You have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to meet deadlines. You have to be able to do this in a, a way that you're providing great information, great service to those, again, that, that you're serving here. You get it done in a specified time period here. Marketing and networking, all right? Right now, 
as you're coming out of, uh, or if you're in, you're in your academic career, but eventually coming out trying to look for a job, you're trying to market yourself, okay? But in the agency, you're trying to market us and make others, those again who we serve, understand who we are, what we do, and what we can do for them. That's the important part. How we can help them make, so they can make the decisions that ultimately affect their lives and uh, their livelihood. So you market and you network, okay? You get to know people. You get to build relationships with folks, uh, lasting relationships, so they come to trust you and want the information that you have to, to, pro to provide them. Oral and written communication. Um, you're in school, so hopefully this is things that you do well there. Oral communication, obviously, you have to be able to communicate well with your peers, with your customers. That includes listening to them first, understanding their needs, all right, and then what you can do to help them meet those needs. So listening is huge in that. Uh, written communication, I've been doing uh, editing papers and memos and, and things for a long time, publishing some papers, and it's amazing how um, adults, some can't write very well at all. So when you're preparing your resume, writing is very important. Can you provide the information in a concise but complete format that has proper English, proper, proper punctuation, and, and so on? Uh, that's, that's really important. And uh, I'd like to see that. And somebody who can do that well could be above someone who maybe can't do that quite as well, all else being equal. Research. You're in school, um, most of you. And if you're doing some sort of research, maybe for a senior project, a capstone project or something with a, with a professor, or maybe in grad school, you'd maybe doing a master's. And I don't know, maybe a couple of few years or a few of you want to go on to get a PhD. But anyway, some sort of research. And in the weather service, it might be more applied research to operations where you're doing case studies and researching an event that occurred and what you can learn from it uh, to ultimately, again, provide a, a better outcome, a better service in, in the long run. If you can attend a conference, that's a great way to uh, meet people, to network, to market yourself, and to uh, learn some skills and some science skills that maybe you didn't get in the classroom. IT skills. This is a way to separate yourself. If, if you have it and you have the opportunity to take some software classes, Python, GIS is a big one, C++ and so on. Those things are valued, a valued commodity as you come out of school. If you don't have those, it's not a showstopper, but again, it's just one thing to help you out and uh, to market you a little bit better. So let's look at people skills and interpersonal skills here. So as you imagine, as you know, it's critical to get hired and it's critical in the workplace. We want people who have high character, integrity, and courage, okay? Character and integrity makes sense. Courage is, is the person who's not afraid to get outside their comfort zone and do more than is, is expected. Even the little things, the fourth bullet there, willingness to do anything, that can set yourself apart. Heck, here at, at our office, let's say if we didn't have uh, the cleaning crew able to come in or, or whatever. I don't care, I'll go and clean the bathrooms if I have to. I mean, it's not something I wanna do, but I'll do it because you gotta be willing to do anything that really uh, gets noticed. The little things get noticed and that builds the reputation that you develop, all right? So be willing to do anything, you know, have the courage to go above and beyond, all right? Don't just sit there and wait for something to come to you. You go and get it, so to speak. So be open-minded, have a positive attitude, all right? All this builds uh, is essential to building uh, teamwork, again, effective communication. You build trust with folks, friendships, lasting relationships, camaraderie, and ultimately you move that office forward, uh, again, with your teammates in order to do what your organization ultimately does, which in our case serves people. What don't we want? All right, well, we don't want someone who's arrogant. Now, obviously, uh, there can be a fine line of being confident. You want to be confident, but not arrogant, okay? And obviously, you don't want to be condescending. And you don't want to be an I person, okay? I did this. I did that. I did everything. I developed the internet, whatever whatever I might mean. Now, when you do your resume and your, your, your listing, your accomplishments, you have to put what you did. But instead of saying, for instance, oh, I am the president of my local AMS chapter at my university, you just say, president of local AMS chapter at, you know, university. You don't need all the I's. We, a few I's is okay, but I, 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 I is just too many. 
So you don't want to be a narcissist type person. Okay, if you're a, if you're a uh, constant or a, a habitual complainer or a whiner, I mean, we're all human beings. We all do that to some degrees, but uh, if that is more of your norm or your reputation, then that's not a good thing. We probably wouldn't want you uh, here in our office. Uh, go skip one the complacent for a second, go to roadblocker and troublemaker. Obviously those are pretty self-explanatory, but a complacency. I always thought the one thing that could ruin a weather service is for its, its people to be complacent, okay? Or on autopilot, basically you do the bare minimum, what, what you have to do, but nothing more. And that's the worst thing. When you're complacent, you don't learn, you don't move forward, you don't have the courage to take on new responsibilities and serve people in a much better way. Complacency kills, okay? Again, the opposite of that, be aggressive, be passionate, and be hungry in everything that you do. And that includes not just in the weather service, but in, you know, in college and, and anything you do in your life. So on our end, hiring officials, we need to be aware of a few things. We don't want to make, we can't make pre-selections, all right? In our office, there is no such thing as, as that. And anybody has to watch their biases in everything we do, okay? Not just in hiring, but we all have human bias. And that affects the decisions we make and the actions that we take. So we need to all watch that. And sometimes it's somebody else who can tell us our biases more than we realize what our own biases are. So in terms of hiring here, we have to really be careful if it's someone we know well, that that doesn't over bias us or if somebody from our alma mater or maybe even someone who's related to us or even like a, a friend's kid or whatever, because the process must be fair and equitable. So we have to treat all people the same way and look at their qualifications, okay? And that's what's important and go through the process in the same way with each individual. There's some recommendations here for interview do's and don'ts and uh, some policy legal requirements again on with workforce management. Communication with applicants, the next slide here. This is something that we try to do very much so. This was, uh, John told me, again, John Gordon, the MIC here in Louisville, uh, mentioned that Brian Lamar, who's the MIC at the Tampa, Florida office, kind of started this and he got the idea from him. But we want to let you know where you stand. And uh, we've all been there. We've all been in your shoes long ago. Like, like Ryan said, long ago, I went to college. And uh, when you're applying for a job, you want to know where you stand. Okay. And if somebody doesn't communicate that to you, you have no idea. Like if you apply for a job and, you know, weeks and weeks go by and you hear nothing, you think, well, oh, heck, am, am I still in the, in the running? Or am I been eliminated? I don't have any idea because nobody's told me. So we want to try to communicate every step of the way, the process of what's happening. So you know where you stand. Okay. And I'm sure you appreciate this a lot. I mean, because we care. Again, we're, we're very pro student and we've all been there. We care, we know what it's like, so we wanna make sure that you know where you stand, so we do that in the process. So what is the process, okay? Here at Louisville, uh, we, I got different rounds here for you. It's not a boxing match, it's not like round one of, of the boxing match, but it's round one of the interview process here. And the first thing is going through your resume, your application, and do a triage of all these ref, uh, resumes and, and checking references as well. The last, uh, the last, thing we the last people that we hired for new meteorologist positions in the weather service here um, at Louisville, we had two openings. We had 100 applications, I'm sorry, 180 about applications for that. 180 and we're taking two. That's not good odds. So you're, again, that goes back to really trying to set yourself apart, but we got to go through all those folks. All right. So we look at these resumes, we go through, we note significant accomplishments, anything unique, that you've done that's like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. That maybe somebody else hasn't done. And again, anything that might separate you from the competition, all right? Good grades is obviously very important in school, um, but there's other things that are very important as well. It's just not good grades because you know a lot of people can get good, good grades. Which one do we take out of all those people? So what we'll do is we'll separate the, the, the resumes into piles. There's yes, because they're gonna move on to round two. There's no, for whatever reason, they're not. And then there's a maybe pile, we're not sure. We need to do a little bit more checking with references and past supervisors uh, and then see until we go through all the, the rest of the applications and see, okay, who do we have now and what are we gonna do? When we do move to the second round, again, we're gonna tell you, we're gonna say, congratulations, you have moved, moved on to round two 
and now that process is written questions and that the others who don't move on that they unfortunately didn't make it this time around. So depending on how many candidates we get for a particular job, we might send out three or four questions to about the top 10 or 20 candidates. Again, that, that can vary. And usually it's probably one question from each of the management team, the MIC, the SU, the WCM, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist, and the ESA, the Electronic Systems Analyst. And then each one goes and grades our own question only, you know, to try to be fair within our own question. And then we compare overall scores. And from that, that's another thing that we'll use to figure out how round three will shake out, which is the orals, which I'll talk about in a second. So on your end, you have time to do this. All right, you might have a couple of days at minimum, maybe several days to formulate a really good answer. So that's when you should really take time and put effort into this. Again, the written communication comes in here. So be thoughtful and thorough, but also concise. That's important as well, conciseness, because we will limit you to the, uh, you know, how long your answer can be and in what format. We don't want dissertations for every answer here, even if you would like to write one. All right, so the third round is orals or interviews. The whole management team is involved. We usually have 10, 12 questions for you. Sometimes they'll have multiple parts. Uh, some of the question types are uh, a weather briefing where we'll simulate, hey, somebody is called and needs a briefing for, I don't know, an, an outside concert that they're having and they know a, a cold front's coming in that might have some thunderstorms here later today. So you have to provide a brief briefing on and, and you know talk to that person and what to expect. It's just to kind of see how you talk uh, a little bit and how you can communicate with someone. There's questions that deal with behavior, personality, science questions, IT type questions, and then vision. Visions about, vision about yourself and your career, what you think, and vision about the weather service and where you think the agency should or is going. There might be a couple time questions where, I don't know, maybe we'll have, to, we'll give you a uh, you know, the media wants a soundbite on what you think the, what the winner is going to be like. So that's a question that can trip people up, but it trips a lot of people up. So if you mess up, it's, you know, do your best, but don't, don't worry about it. There's short answer word association questions. So like if we say weather ready nation, what comes to your mind in one sentence or one phrase? So it's just a short little association there. And then scenarios, scenarios are important. So here's a, here's a couple, um, Scenarios. And this wouldn't be something that you would get as a, you know, coming out of college and trying to get hired in. These are more advanced for people that have been in the agency for a while. So this one here is just some example from maybe a person who is applying for a lead forecaster. And this one says that assume you are the lead forecaster and there's a tornado watching effect. You have a lot of staffing there and there's a large tornado on the ground and it's coming at you and you all need to take cover. So our backup office who could provide service for us when we can't in our case is Paducah. So we call them and, and we tell them the story, but say, I'm sorry, we really can't help you. We're busy with storms too. We're very short staff. We don't have the people to, to help you. What would you do? So it's just trying to get you thinking on your toes of what would you do if some situation comes up? Because it's real life, this stuff happens. And I know we're catching you, you know, I have a lot of time to think about it. We're just trying to see what some initial responses are. And there's no like perfect answer. Um, you know, it's just a few things we're trying to see if, if you realize at the time. This one here at the bottom is more if, say, if you're going to uh, become a manager or maybe even MIC. In this case, it's a personnel type scenario because you have some freezing drizzle that wasn't expected that caused a lot of wrecks, some fatalities. Your midnight lead forecaster calls you at home at six o'clock saying, hey, that the day shift, they can't get in. And one of them was in a wreck and is on her way to the hospital. And one of the electronic technicians, his car bumped into, into another car in, your own, in the office parking lot. You, you try to go a contractor to, to sand and, and to salt everything, but they're not available. So what would you do? So those are types of scenario questions. We like scenarios. I mean, you might get a few uh, in the interview and they're not gonna be like all scenarios, but there'll be a, at least a couple, two, three. All right, so continuing on the third round, this is for you, advice for you guys, just quickly, if you're doing an interview, the first thing is to relax. <laughs> relax, think about your answers because, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, you're on the spot. So you're trying to think about what you're, what you're responding to before you quickly, you know, so take a couple seconds before you respond if you need to. And don't get hung up on a bad answer because you're inevitably gonna give a bad answer, but know that everybody else is giving bad answers as well sometimes. So if you get hung up and if you gave a bad answer, 
you're likely not listening to subsequent questions or giving as good of an answer as you may otherwise had, had you not been hung up on the one that you felt you didn't do right. Now, what you can do at the end, and we'll listen to it, I don't know if everyone else is, you can at the end of the interview say, hey, I know I answered question four not too well, do you mind if I re-answer it? And they may or may not say that's fine. If you're a golfer at all, you know what a mulligan is, it's a do-over. We give you one chance to answer a question later. If you're not sure at the time we ask it, we'll come back to it at the end. Most people don't use that, and that's okay if you know what, what you wanna answer, but use it, take advantage of it, because for us, we give you that opportunity and there's no penalty if you do. But you would have to know if the interviewee is, or the Vinny, I'm sorry, the interviewer is gonna allow that or not. When you answer questions, always have some examples to go with it to help illustrate maybe a philosophical statement that you gave. Those examples can come from anything in your life, not just in your academic career. And then this is really important. Ask some questions, a couple of questions at the end, after the formal interview ends, or maybe even make a final statement because engage us in conversation. That's so important because you're gonna be nervous when you give an interview. But at the end, you might, don't ask us a question like, well, when are you gonna decide on, on the selection? Well, we'll tell you that. But you might have been on our website and said, hey, uh, I noticed that you guys do a lot of research in, in quasi-linear convective systems, severe storms, and I'm really interested in that. How could I help you with that? Or I'm really interested in outreach and, and going out to schools and talking about meteorology to younger kids. Can I, how could I help with that? Those are the things that get conversations going. And when that happens, nerves disappear. I'll tell you the two that we just hired about four or five months ago, they were nervous, okay? That doesn't matter, we still hired them, but it was the after interview conversation that really allowed us to see much better how they really are when they're not on the spot and nervous, okay? It really opens up the personality. So I would advise having that uh, in your arsenal ready to go after a, a formal interview. All right, so round four. Sometimes in the first interview, we don't get a clear winner. So we had to go to a second interview. And that would just be maybe with the top two or three candidates, which would be a shorter interview, only a few questions, and conducted by just the MIC or maybe MIC and one or two management members. So when it comes time to, for, to select, the selection is not just based on the orals or the resume, it's based on everything, okay? Everything that you see there in that first bullet is very important. So you might not do as well in one, but you did great on others and we still take you, all right? It's a, the, full, uh, you know, the full process here that we're considering here. And I'll tell you, the best candidate and the best fit wins. Uh, for somebody who's already in a weather source, we don't care if he or she is already on station and we know them well or off station, okay? Because we're getting information about that person off station from someone else or a couple people. So we don't really care. It's the best candidate, the best fit. I guess this wouldn't apply for you guys uh, if you've never been in a weather service before coming out of college, obviously. So the important thing is here is we do a lot of due diligence throughout the entire process. And when we do that, we don't know where the best person is coming from. We don't know if they're behind door number one, door number two, or door number three, but they're in there. And through this due diligence, a lot of times, most of the time, we'll end up with great employees who we love having, uh, and they help lead our office forward. So continuing on the selection, we'll, we'll coordinate through the regional headquarters. Then we have to wait for workforce management to send out an official offer. That can take a little time. Um, but once that does occur and once the candidate does accept, then we will email our staff and we will welcome you to our family. And that's what we consider ourselves, our family. And as soon as you, soon as you are hired, you're part of that, okay? And you always will be. Um, one thing that we'll do here in bullet three is, is talk to the other candidates as well. I'm not sure if all offices will do this. We feel that we have an obligation to do so because we wanna help you. If you didn't get selected, we're not gonna tell you, like, we're not gonna tell six of you that you all finished number two. Some people might do that. Oh, you finished number two. Oh, you finished number two. Oh, we all finished number two, great. We're gonna get, we're gonna tell you, be honest. Okay, you finished sixth, all right? You might think, sixth, well, that's not so good. Well, you finished sixth out of 180 people. That's pretty darn good. There's just a few things maybe you can do next time that might help you out. So if you want feedback from the top candidates, maybe, I don't know, the top 10 or so that we end up with, if you come to us, we'll give you honest, meaningful feedback that you can use and leverage and maybe the next time that you do a, an interview with somebody else. Okay, because look at this as a new beginning, a new opportunity. Every time you bid an, an, for a job, that's a new opportunity for you, okay? Maybe you don't get it, but you learn from it and eventually you do get it.
okay? And it's the same way for us. It's an exhausting process, but one that really helps match uh, the office with the person who really is the best fit, the best person who's gonna do a fantastic uh, job for us. So this is not just the most important thing for us as hiring officials, it's the most important thing that you will do, all right? So take time and develop a great resume. Um, have people look at it and give you advice. You know, bring your A game. You want to separate yourself. And that doesn't start tomorrow. That should have already have started of separating yourself by doing a lot of things, not just in school, but anything you've done in your personal life, in the community, all kinds of things that just show the type of person and the character that you have. All right, make it count. And this is my final slide. As, as Ryan said at the beginning, John Gordon, the meteorologist in charge here, was supposed to give this, but uh, he and I, again, see very eye to eye. We're both involved with the process here very much. So if you have any questions uh, besides contacting Ryan, as he had said, John or I will be glad to uh, answer any questions or give advice even after this webinar is over. So that's all I got. I appreciate your time and I'll be glad to take a few questions if you have any. All right, thanks, Ted, very much. Uh, great talk, great tips there. Um, I just want to piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, we've been giving you the theme you can start to see in these talks is this is a very competitive field to get into. And, um, you know, I just want you to know that uh, don't get down on yourselves. Rejection is part of life and it's going to happen to you. Maybe it's happened to you already uh, getting into schools. You're not going to get every job you applied for. It doesn't mean you're not a great meteorologist. It just means that maybe you weren't the best fit for this position, or maybe um, you've got a few skills to work on. Um, I always t think about it this way. Uh, a, a very recent example, I don't know if there's any hockey fans out there, but uh, Joel Quinville is the coach of the Chicago Blackhawks. He just got fired this week. He's got three Stanley Cups and probably going to the Hall of Fame. It doesn't make him a bad coach. Um, it's going to happen. Um, we do have one question here. Um, this is a good one. This is from uh, Michelle, and she says, hello, I have a general question about getting started in the workforce. I have 10 plus years of restaurant experience and five plus years of management experience within the restaurant industry. When it comes to entry level positions, do you believe that this is something that can help to stand out on resumes, even though it isn't related to meteorology? Yeah, anytime you, you I mean, you want to tell us what you did. If, if you haven't been able to, to, you know, let's say you got a meteorology degree, but you didn't get a job, so you're in some other field. I mean, that's okay, because we want to see what did you do during that period of time. If you just sat around and did nothing, you know, that doesn't bode too well. But if you have really stepped up and have made the best out of any of the opportunities that you have been given, that's what we want to see. Not everyone has the same opportunities, but we want to see what you did with those that you, you did get, all right, and how you stepped up, how you demonstrate leadership potential, and, and all the things that I, that I mentioned. I mean, obviously, I would put the things that are most relevant to the job first on a resume, but don't say, well, they won't think this is important. Put it down, because the selecting official, you don't know what they're looking for, but in general, it shows that you have been busy and you have been taking advantage of time and, and, and trying to keep up with things within your field while working in, in another field. So definitely yes, and especially the managerial, the managerial, yeah, I can't say that, the management part of that, because that shows how you can work well with people. So that's that part is really important as well. Great, and then I had one that if you could just in a, in a couple minutes, some people on this uh, webinar may not know exactly what a science and operations officer does. And so if you could just uh, quickly give a brief overview of, of what your position is. <laughs> well, I've been doing this for quite a while. I've been a sous since, uh, gosh, 94. That's a number of years. And I still don't know if I know what this position is about some days. But anyway, you're really involved with, with a bunch of everything. Bottom, and basically the Sioux, the science operations officers, you are the training person for the office. You are involved with training the staff on you know, how to radar signature, how to issue proper warnings, winter weather processes, the, you know, new software, new, new techniques come in. You're, you're, you're the training person for the office, but you also oversee operations. So anything that happens within operations, technically I or the soup person oversees, but everyone in the office contributes to that stuff. 
So it's not just there's a Sioux and then there's everyone else. It's it's like, like I said, it's kind of like a family. Everyone's contributing to these programs and making a meaningful contribution. And that really helps me out. So yeah, I'm kind of the, the internal guy uh, involved with that. The WCM, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist, he or she is more the external person who's dealing with uh, spotters and, and, and uh, FEMA and uh, and partners and, and all our partners out there who need the information that we provide, the service that we provide. But again, there's, there's and then there's not a, a wall between the two. Everyone works together for the same ultimate purpose. Hopefully that answered your question a little bit. But again, the Sioux will be involved with hiring as, as this is and, and, and anything else. Like I said, clean the toilets if they needed me to. <laughs> All right, I got one more quick one uh, from Jerry uh, that says, I am a manager that hires meteorologists and met techs. You mentioned that personality is a go or no go flag right off the start. Do you have any advice on how you can get a measure of those qualities in the interview environment? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, the, the way we first start that, because I mean, a lot of people we don't know. Um, some people we will know, and it's easy to detect that already but for those we don't know we, we rely heavily on the accurate and honest advice of the references and if it's somebody who's coming from college the professors that he or she has and believe me we will check and your reputation goes a long way so everything that you've done up until now and will do that all gets noticed and that gets passed on so you be the you know you do the best you can it's, it's sometimes again it's, it's the little stuff so um let's see the other part of that question was what was the other read the last part of that question again ryan are you there sorry i was on mute hold on <laughs> yeah it's a, do you have any advice on how you can get a measure of those qualities in the interview environment Oh, yeah, yeah. And that reminded me of one other thing I wanted to say. So actually, during the interview, we should have a good handle because we you probably won't even advance in the interview stage if, if you didn't get checked out well with when we check references and, and past supervisors or, or, or co-workers or, or what have you. But having several people in on the interview process when we do the orals is really important because we each hear a little bit different. Somebody might pick up on arrogance that I didn't pick up at all or I might pick up on a good thing that someone else didn't pick up at all. So we do a lot of cross checking and we talk afterwards amongst ourselves because several people listening to the same input, the same interview really helps us kind of decide that we can pick up little subtleties there. And again, that's why I said after the interview, those questions and conversation, casual conversation you can have asked the interview. That's why that is so important because we can pick up something that's totally different and a lot of times even better than maybe the nervousness or the bad answer that came through in the interview itself. Hopefully that kind of addresses your question.